Welcome to episode 42 of Engaging Franciscan Wisdom. My name is Sister Michelle Lallier, and I'm happy to introduce our guest host, Darlene Prides. Welcome, Darlene. Thanks, Michelle. It's great to be here. It's been some time since you were interviewed for episode seven early in the life of this podcast. Much has happened in our lives and in our world since then. Through it all, our friendship and collaborations have continued to grow. Thank you for bringing your gifts as a professor and writer, as a researcher and curious explorer of Franciscan life, and as a hospice caregiver, to a mini-series of interviews on countercultural living. How did you choose this theme? Thanks for asking, Michelle. I think when we hear countercultural living, some of us think of the 1960s and the hippies movement, but <laughs> I think that the Franciscan way is in countercultural. It's a it's a path in which we uh, let go of expectations, our own expectations, and the expectations of society. So, I wanted to explore with practitioners in the tradition what countercultural means to them, and frankly, how they persevere in this path. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to listening to each of these episodes. May you and all who listen. Enjoy, but also draw forth learnings from these conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. It's such a pleasure to be here today to have a conversation with someone you know very well, Carmen Barsotti, who, like you, is a Franciscan sister of Little Falls, Minnesota. And I bet I first met Carmen thanks to you. So thank you, Michelle, for bringing us together. This makes a nice bridge to my guest hosting the next few segments of Engaging Franciscan Wisdom, which, as you mentioned, is going to be exploring a countercultural life by living into Franciscan values. So I'm really happy to welcome you, Carmen. There are many things I could say about you by way of introduction, that you're from Elk River, Minnesota, where you grew up in a large family. You have 85 first cousins. You've lived in many places, including Venezuela, Nicaragua, and now you're living in San Francisco, where you co-founded an organization called Faithful Fools in 1998. I'm eager to learn more about your life and how you've crafted a life around Franciscan values in a way that I call countercultural. So welcome. Thank you. It's very nice to be with you, Darlene. It's great to be with you. Your your life is a fascinating one. And I've noticed that you've lived in so many different places around the world. I wonder if we could just start there and ask you to comment on the impact of all these places that you've lived, how it shaped your life. Well, as you said, I was born and raised in Elk River, Minnesota. And Elk River at that time was only about 2,000 people. And I kind of felt like I was related to half of them. I always say when I went into grade school, there were five of us that were in our class that were related to each other. But I look at that small town and the largeness of my family is really foundational. And it's also where I went to grade school to St. Andrews and it was staffed by Franciscan sisters from Little Falls. So from very young, I was rooted and grounded by the Franciscans, but I also had an aunt, Sister Delores Colis, my mom's oldest sister, who was part of our Franciscan community. So really, since I came into this world, I had some relationship with the community that I later joined. And then moving from Elk River, I went to the College of St. Catherine in St. Paul. So that was moving more into a bigger city. And, and I think being in St. Paul, but also at St. Catherine's, it was just an experience of having my own mind expanded to really enlarge my world and my thinking and ways of seeing things. But when I was in St. Catherine's, I was also finding myself kind of restless because I wasn't feeling necessarily interested in just deciding on a career and going into the workforce and living happily ever after. So I decided to quit college in my third year and I went to Venezuela as a lay volunteer with the Franciscan Sisters of Little Falls. And 
that was just really a, a point of change in my life that I found myself not only being immersed in a world outside of the United States, but to encounter that level of, I like to say, impoverishment of peoples. And it gave me a different view of my own country and our actions in other countries that aren't always very positive. And when I came back from Venezuela, well, actually it was while I was in Venezuela that I decided to join the Franciscan sisters. And I think at that point, I just really believe that what compelled me to say yes to that urging was working with a group of women that I really shared values with. And I also somehow knew at that point, even though I think everybody thought I would have lots of children, because I was always caring for children, that there was this sense that if I brought a family into the world, I needed to prioritize their stability. And I really wanted the freedom to move around and to continue to move where I felt called. So I decided to join the Franciscan sisters and, and I joined on April Fool's day in 1984. So that was kind of my destiny, I suppose. But, and then as an information with the Franciscan, I was introduced to civil disobedience as we would go down to Honeywell and protest the making of cluster bombs and things that I had come to learn how they affected people in the world, war-torn countries. And I remember when I was arrested under civil disobedience, somebody said to my mother, what do you think of Carmen getting arrested? And her comment was, since she has come back from Venezuela, she is different. And somehow I've always just valued that simple statement of hers. It wasn't a condemnation or anything. It felt supportive. I'm sure even in the large questioning around it. And then as a temporary professed is when I went to Chicago and I lived and worked in a Hispanic parish, Providencia de Dios, Providence of God. And I think what was there not only was working directly within the institutional church and all of the challenges of that, and there were many, but it was also while I was in Chicago, we worked with cluster parishes. So it was this big thing to feel like it was, it was great that we could get six parishes to work together and do some visioning and planning. But then when I moved to Nicaragua from there, I came to work in an ecumenical setting, which was even more expansive and more exciting. But also in Nicaragua, it was our community's choice just to move into a barrio and live amongst the people with the people and allow our life to evolve out of that rather than to move into a community with an idea of we were going to bring something to them. And I was just very enriched by living in Nicaragua and also even more enlightened, learned a lot more because Nicaragua had had much more direct intervention by the United States and the Contra War had just finished. And so I learned a lot and was in a country that at the time that we arrived, more than 50% of the people were under the age of 15 because so many had been killed in the war. And so much of our work there was just bringing people together again as brothers and sisters. And there actually was a former Franciscan who worked there who was bringing, it was a reconciliation project that he was working with bringing together Nicaraguans who had some fought in the Contra army and some in the Sandinistas and bringing them together as brothers and sisters to rediscover their common 
connection and their common values. And then from Nicaragua, I... Before we move on, yes. I, there's just so much I want to ask. There's just such richness here. So let me just start by saying, can you take me into one day of your life in Nicaragua? Can you tell me what did it smell like? What did it look like? What did it taste like? Well, it, we lived right in the barrio and we had a cinder block house while most of our neighbors were in houses made of boards or zinc. And they slowly, sometimes were able to slowly build cinder block homes. And when we first built our structure, we had a whole wall that was not solid. It was just the iron bars. So it was very much living with people. I always said, I don't think there was even five minutes of quiet in my whole time down there because you could always hear some radio going or the vendors going down the street selling tortillas or vegetables. And there were always kids playing. And one of the things I loved is we had a little porch on the front of our house and kids would come knocking on the door and ask to borrow books or puzzles. And they'd just sit on the steps and play. And that was just joyous to me, to all of us. But also we very much worked with women and youth down there. And it's where I came to understand domestic violence in a way that I had never encountered in my own life up to that point. And so we worked a lot with women who were struggling to find their own independence, their own freedom to not be enslaved by their domestic partners. So we worked a lot on many, many realms, but I think most of the day to day is very much like what I am here uh, with Faithful Fools is much of the day gets directed by who might arrive at the door or what need arises and needs a response as well as, um, working with some more formal meetings and intentional conversations and classes and things like that. So it really was about being present in the moment. Exactly. And then when I was in Nicaragua, we also received a lot of groups, you know, many mission groups would come down and amidst the excitement of that and the, the generosity of that, there was also a lot of questioning for me because I would recognize that people who came really had not an understanding of the United States history in a country like Nicaragua, their understanding even of the war that had just finished. So people would come down with this desire and this generosity to help the poor. And when we would raise up conversations of the faces of poverty, the growing impoverishment of people in our own country, there came a lot of judgment. There came the myths of if people could just pull themselves up by their bootstraps or somebody is poor because of choices they made. And so I, I began to wrestle a lot with that. And then it came to about 19... 97, I came up to San Francisco for a few months of sabbatical. And when I arrived in San Francisco, it was the first dot-com era. It was when Yahoo and Google were coming into being and homelessness was a headline topic. Many people frustrated as housing prices were going up. There was a 1% vacancy rate. And so I began to kind of feel pulled to come back to the United States and worked from a place of helping to raise awareness, to help people be engaged in our own country with what was happening, to come to learn more about what was impoverishing people as a systemic impoverishment, as well as just choices we were making. And so as tough as it was, I decided to leave Nicaragua and came up to San Francisco. And it was at that time then that I, I had met Kay Jorgensen, 
who was a Unitarian Universalist minister. And she was kind of being pulled in the same direction. She had just finished serving a parish in Minnesota and was out here living with her daughter. And so my spiritual teacher, Raisa Leah Landman, brought Kay and I together. And in that first meeting, in a couple hours of talking, we recognized that we had something we were called to do together. So I went back to Nicaragua. Michelle was there and we closed our mission there. And I came up to San Francisco. And from there, in a very short time, in a matter of a couple months, Kay and I had founded Faithful Fools. And that's where I live and work at this time. Yeah, and San Francisco, boy, so much is happening in that city. You've seen a lot in the last 22 years. Can you just take us through those early years of founding Faithful Fools, what, what you and Kay hoped to do, and then what was the reality? I think because Kay and I didn't know each other, we spent a lot of time walking the streets together, just kind of telling our own stories but also talking about our own longings of what we wished to see in the world and what we wish to see in our own religious institutions. And we decided that, uh, well, first to say Kay was a professional mime and clown before she became a Unitarian Universalist minister. So it's a little bit of playing the fool. She would often say that Oscar, her clown, could be much more honest then and direct and brave than Kay herself could be. But I think as we walked, we just simply asked ourselves the question, how it was that we came to be so passionate and engaged and compelled to do the things that we were doing in the world. And it really was just simply out of the relationships with the people we had come to know along the way out of relationships with our own personal stories. And so we wanted to create a kind of container and invitation for people to walk and work together. So one of the things that we, one of the first opening acts, we call it, it was our street retreats. We created a retreat farm, a day long retreat in which people come into the community not to volunteer, not to have a tour, but to come into the community of the Tenderloin with the spirit of a retreat, a day of reflection. The mantra that we often use is what holds me separate, what keeps me separated as I walk the streets, what connects me. And it's really a sense of putting ourselves into relationship with a place, with people that we are encouraged to stay away from, that we're encouraged to not come into the Tenderloin. It's that part of the city you're not supposed to come into. But I think also in Founding the Fools that we call it a place of practice. People come from many walks of life, many faith commitments or social values that they're wanting to practice. So this really becomes a place to say, what does it look like in direct relationship with people? What does it look like to live it out? And I think both of us were also grappling with discomforts we felt in our own religious or faith communities that felt like a distance had grown from being immersed in places like the Tenderloin to moving a little bit more towards comfort and safety and security. And I think we both were more enlivened to be at the edges, at the precariousness of the edges. And so we were practicing how we wanted to be. Um, and I had just read a book, Francis and the Foolishness of God, that Michelle and I and others read together in Nicaragua. And also Kay's being a mime and clown and the medieval image of the fool in the king's court that stayed connected with the common people and risked speaking truth to the king. So all of that was really there to encourage us to 
take our feet to the streets and simultaneously speak out what it was we were seeing and hearing. So, so once again, I'm, what I'm hearing you, um, recount is the seeking presence, being present with each other, being present with yourself as well. I love this mantra that you mentioned, what holds me separate, what keeps me separated, what connects me. These are questions that you and Kay first asked yourselves before asking other people to reflect on these. So I want to pursue this issue of the, the role of the fool, but before we get there, it, it feels to me like what you and Kay first had to address, and, and maybe I'm projecting, but did you have any fear? Any fear upon arriving in the tenderloin? And what did you do? What, what were your feelings? And certainly people who attend street retreats, some of them come with fear. So are you really asking yourselves and others to, to first acknowledge or see that fear for what it is? Well, personally, I didn't feel afraid and, and it was rather funny because when I first came back from Nicaragua, I lived in the hills of Berkeley in a little studio. It was two years of our walking and working together before Kay and I found what now is the fool's court right in the tenderloin. And that's where I felt fear because when I was in the barrio and now living in the tenderloin or even in Chicago, there were always people around. And so I, I, I always counted on that. And when I was living in the Berkeley Hills, there was so often that nobody was around that people would move around in their cars and they come in and they automatically open the garage door and go in and then close the garage door and go in the house. So I often felt that in that void, if something happened, I, I couldn't count on anybody. And so that's more where I encountered the fear, but people do come with fear, but we don't assume that because one of the lines we have in our mission statement is discover our common humanity on the streets. And one of the things that we know as human beings is some of what gets projected onto communities like the tenderloin of substance abuse issues or violence or abandonment or whatever is not exclusive to communities like the tenderloin. They are something that many, many people know. And I think for me, I'm actually, it's easier to work in a community where there's an honesty about that rather than in communities where it's hidden or there's a silence or we don't talk about it. So I find myself much more alive and rooted and um, really free in barrios and in the tenderloin. And so, yeah, and, and I think people do come, we'd have people come for street retreats from various communities. And I remember one woman coming over from Berkeley and she used the retreat to memorialize her sister who had died on the streets. And while her sister was alive, she just was not able to meet her there to be with her. And so this gave her an opportunity to reconnect with her sister in a way it really became a process of healing. I remember another woman who came from a university in the East Bay and, you know, I think it was a called a compassion practicum class or something like that. And so we did our opening circle to the retreat and all of that. And, and when she stepped outside, she said, what am I doing? I was an addict on the streets of the Tenderloin. And all of a sudden that vulnerability came back to her. And the first thing she did was went and found a 12 step group to give her the kind of framework and rootedness to be able to then be in the streets for the day. And so I think there's a lot of healing that happens for people who come through the street retreats and 
And there definitely are people who are afraid. There will be people who, one woman who said, I thought I came from a liberal family, but when I was invited to a street retreat, I realized I'd rather spend a night in the woods with bears than I would go into the tenderloin. So we never know what people are coming with, and that's part of the richness of the retreat. But I would say it a lot of um, healing, a lot of opening does have the possibility of happening when one retreats and when one is present with what's coming up exactly and facing it um, being present with it making friends as Thich Nhat Hanh would say making friends with what comes up yeah I think I had cut you off of, about the role of the fool did you want to pursue that a little bit more well, I think I've reflected a lot on the role of the fool this last year because we often think of kind of this, this funky character at the folly of the fool. But I, as I spent time with the fool, I really realized what an interior life one who is a fool has to have in order to have a steadiness of being, a steadiness of presence in many different realms and in many different environments. And one of the I think it might have been Lewis Hyde in his book, Trickster Makes This World, speaks of how a fool or a trickster does not change in, in different environments. You know, like sometimes you go amongst the wealthier and all of a sudden you've got this kind of persona that is different than if I'm on the streets. And I think a strong interior sense of self brings forth a constancy, an integrity of being that doesn't change or doesn't place greater value on one person than another. I like Ken Fight, who was a Jesuit and a clown, and he spoke to, I'm aspire, or I'm not a fool, I'm aspiring. That's what I aspire to. And I kind of feel that way, that I have not yet come to the place of feeling a complete fool but it certainly is a, a character to aspire to. And it's such a worthy one. I, you know, when I hear you speak of this constancy of the, the integrity of being, to be constant with each person who is before you, that itself is, is countercultural, don't you think? At least in United States culture. I do. I think there's a lot, you know, that, even from very young, you know, you dress up a certain way for certain environments and you behave a certain way in different environments and you wear certain clothing in certain environments. And, and it's not just a practical thing, it's what's expected of you. And, and I think like for Francis, to me, that's who Francis was, Francis was a a fool, you know, that Francis really, no matter whether he was speaking to the bishop or speaking to the people on the streets or in the community or from house to house, is that um, he was steady in his being and how he wanted to be, even in its imperfection. But he was, you would know this better than I, but I remember Francis did not want the brothers to take a position that would place them above another. And, and that's been really strong for me in terms of the fool. And it's a hard thing for some people when they come to faithful fools. I remember one person saying, I paid a lot of money to have this title behind my name because here I'm just Carmen and it's who I just want to be is Carmen. And even if people come with their, their gifts or their talents or their skills, we are all just fools. And, and that takes a while for people to, to realize. And I remember for myself, just a visual I would do very consciously and still do is if I'm in conversation with somebody, I just do a self check to see whether I really have myself at the same level. And if I realize I've got a little bit more 
air than I want to have is I, I image myself on one of these barber stools and just kind of turning myself down energetically till I feel like, okay, now I'm really here. Now I'm really with this person in the place that I want to be. And, and I, I feel like that's how Francis, where Francis was most comfortable. Yeah, he did that. He, he was challenged sometimes though, you know, he would erupt in anger sometimes, or he would be frustrated with himself if he didn't act according to what he knew his values were. So he, he did have challenges. And I hear what you're saying that when you catch yourself, you, you do this self-check. I guess I want to ask you, what are some of the biggest challenges that you have in embracing this, this countercultural path, this, this way of the fool? I think one of the tougher places and, and especially coming as a Franciscan in a Franciscan community is that what I have available to me that so many people in the world don't and how to reconcile that. Like sister Susan Knudsen and I, Susan was out here many years with me also. And we used to say, isn't it amazing that we who have vowed poverty have greater stability than most of the other people in the circle. And that's, that's one of the realities that really challenges me to keep working for a world that all may have life and have it to the full, all have what they need. Um, and I think also other challenges is just staying with the very difficult dialogue of how much just of being it, born as a white person in this world and what has been available to me as I work with others and some of my colleagues who come from generational poverty, generational exclusion from many of the benefits of our society. And I think the other challenge is a big one for me and for Kay and I as two women who founded an organization that to continue to encounter what that means. I know that people who were very dear to us would say, Kay and Carmen don't know what they're doing. They need to, to figure it out. And the sense of always kind of being looked at, like we, we didn't know what we were doing. And I think being a woman in the church, being a woman in our society to receive a lot of the, the judgments and prejudices that come with that. And I think for me, I would say that's a thread that's come through my life is being a woman, even a, a girl child and see the differences between what was expected or offered to the boys that wasn't to the girls, the difference in the roles. And then being in a church, that access to leadership is based in gender, that all of those have been personal experiences that I think continue to compel me to keep working for a world where, again, all may have life and have it to the full, that all people have access to what they need and that all people have not only access to what they need, but share in the wealth of our world. So, and it's, a, it sounds big, but it's in the day to day choices that we make. So yeah, it sounds big. And it also just hearing how you speak, not just what you're speaking, but how you're speaking it. There's so much equanimity in your voice. And I know just from my personal experience, I don't experience that kind of judgment that you're just talking about being judged as a woman in the church with the kind of equanimity that the fool does. The fool holds it lightly, right? I, I hear that in your voice. Is it true? I believe it is. I mean, I certainly, it doesn't mean that I don't feel the anger. It doesn't may, mean that I don't feel the hurt and the pain that goes with that. But I guess I, I work to try to change and to 
stay strong and steady and just being who I am and knowing what I want to be about, that that's where I put my energy more than making public the anger in a way that's kind of vindictive or whatever. Yeah, I don't, I, my anger is deep. My pain is deep and I think it, it more is in that well of commitment to stay with it. You know, Carmen, I, I feel like we could talk for hours and still go deeper and deeper into your experiences and your wisdom. Just for now, I, I wonder, is there anything else you'd like to share with us for this particular time together? One, just an invitation to come walk with faithful fools. Mm -hmm. You'd be in good company since we did the street retreats in 1998. We've had more than 9,000 people make the retreats with us and have done them in different parts of the world also. But I think there's something about being be fearless is what I like to say to people. <laughs> Even if you feel fear, be fearless and feel free to do what you feel called to do in the world. And I think that's one of the pieces I really realized when Kay and I began Faithful Fools is we felt completely free to um, bring forth what we were wanting to bring forth into the world. And I remember our, well, one fellow wrote a letter and he said, they're unstoppable. And, and there's that. And I also do a self check often that I, it's a kind of way and a work that I often say, that even if nobody else understands, I'm going to do what I'm doing. And uh, I think to feel that freedom again, that level of commitment that's greater than myself is is what keeps me here. Oh, well, thank you so much, Carmen. I, I know that I have benefited so much from hearing you, you speak these words of wisdom. So I'm really grateful for your time, for your dedication, and, and most of all for your presence today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Darlene. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast today. I'm looking forward to the next interview in this series on Franciscan spirituality as a countercultural path. And I invite you back to hear Jean-Francois Godet Calagueras, who will share about his life as a scholar of Franciscan texts and share with us how this had prepared him for an itinerant life with many changes. Until then, may you be blessed with peace and all good.